Hello, and welcome to this very special episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. I am, as I usually am, Catherine Troyer, and I'm so excited that I get to be joined, as always, by Tony Tresca. Hey there! Today we get to have one of our eerie extras, which is basically where we put all the things that are not quite our podcast main stuff, but still the stuff that really excites us, and that's a lot of interviews. And I'm so excited because Tony was like, I have someone we are interviewing her. You have no choice on this. And then yep. Tony was like, let me tell you a little bit more. And I was like, okay, good. This sounds amazing. And like my alternative life. So Tony, would you introduce our guest for today? Uh, yes. This is one of my colleagues from CU Boulder, uh, Heather Kelly. What, say hello, Heather. <laughs> hi. Hi, world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Want to say, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to join us. Uh, uh, how's it going? <laughs> you know, it's going great. Uh, school hasn't started up again, so I still have a few days to, you know, do things like laundry. And, yes. Um, all the stuff I didn't do over winter break. So, you know, I'm in a good place. I'm prepping for my classes. I'm excited to have my first semester not taking classes as a student and just teaching. So that's going to be great. That's uh, really exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be a, a whole new ball game this semester. I remember very distinctly that when I was working on my PhD, they say, you know, like at some point you're going to be okay with not taking classes. And I was like, I can't ever imagine that state. And, then, and I was like, nope, yep, I'm definitely there. I'm excited to work on my stuff finally. And that's, it sounds like what you're going to get to do. So yeah. yay. Yeah, but I do, I do still have that sort of like FOMO of like, maybe I should take feminist geography just because. And it's like, no, no, like you're writing a dissertation. Eyes on the prize, Heather. Yes. Like, <laughs> settle down here. <laughs> So that's a great segue. Uh, would you maybe be able to like briefly introduce yourself, kind of introduce your theatrical background and talk a little bit about the PhD that you're currently pursuing and why you decided to pursue that? Sure. Um, so as Tony, you just mentioned, um, I'm a PhD candidate at CU Boulder and uh, a fellow grad student of yours, um, which I'm very lucky to be uh, in theater and performance studies. Uh, and my background is actually uh, almost exclusively as an actor, interestingly. Mm. Um, my BFA and MFA are both in acting. Um, before that, I was a dancer for a long time. Um, and I just, I really think scholarship and artistic practice need to come together more and not be so mm -hmm. sort of siloed from each other. Uh, so part of the reason I decided to come back to get my PhD at the age of 40 uh, was I wanted to feel qualified to teach all kinds of classes, not just like practice-based theater mm -hmm. classes. Uh, and I had had this dream for years that I wanted to write a book about theater and ghosts. Um, and I, I was like, but I don't know if I actually have the tools to write this book. It's just this like thing that I dream about that I'm collecting mm -hmm. these like stories for. Um, I think it could be uh, exciting both for popular audiences and for more academic audiences. But I was like, I, I honestly, how do you write a book? I don't know how to do this. And so I was like, <laughs> maybe what I'm actually trying to write is a dissertation. Mm. Uh, and I should go um, learn from people that have written books, like how you go about yeah. doing that. So honestly, it, sort of the kernel for what has now become my dissertation was really there when I applied for PhD programs and I had no idea if I would get in. I was like this actor that had no proof of like, I can do scholarly writing, you know? And I was just like, you know, you only live once. I'm gonna like throw this at the wall and see if anything sticks. And, and here I am uh, in Boulder. I moved across the country in the oh, middle wow. of the pandemic, uh, 2020. Here I was, I was living in New York City for years with my husband. And I was like, yeah, we're just gonna like uproot it all. And I'm gonna maybe write a book about ghosts. And it's gonna be great. <laughs> What so a that, fantastic. That's, that's, that's my background. <laughs> that's delightful. <laughs> so I'd love you mentioned something really intriguing in there, and I'd love to if you if you could go a little bit deeper on that. What in your mind does it kind of look like this blend between scholarship and artistic practice? And kind of how does your background in practice really set you up for what you're doing now? And I should add that this is a very receptive audience because both Tony and I 100% agree with this. We just want someone else <laughs> to say why it's so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, I don't know. I think, for example, in my acting training, 
you would be taught specific techniques, like say you're working on Stanislavski or you're working on Meisner, or you're working on Chekhov or um, you know any any number of techniques, but they were always called that, right? They were technique. They were never called theory. Like theory was sort of this other thing, like. I don't know, smarter people do off somewhere else. It's like different than what people, actual practitioners are doing every day. And I, this always sort of like bucked against that because I'm like, isn't it the same thing? Like mm -hmm. one is doing the thing, one is thinking about doing the thing, but like you kind of have to <laughs> both have both and do both in order to bring anything to the table as either a scholar mm -hmm. or artist. Um, so I don't know, I guess I've just always sort of like, I didn't like, I kind of like pushed against that. Um, yeah. And ways I think about uh, incorporating the two in my own life and work, um, I think about, I think all the way back 20 years ago now to when I was an undergrad. Uh, and there was all this cachet at the time. I went to this um, conservatory called University of the Arts in Philadelphia that was all artists, not just performing artists, mm -hmm. but visual artists as well. And their big thing was like, all of our professors are working professionals, mm -hmm. um, which was code for like, they're still doing the thing and not just teaching the thing. Uh, and at the time, I, I guess I didn't necessarily know why that was so important, but like <laughs> the farther I moved away from that, the more I'm like, oh, because you should also still be learning and you should also mm -hmm. still be surprised as an educator and you should be learning as much from your students as as they're learning from you uh and it's really important to still be getting your hands dirty to not just be like talking about this thing you haven't actually had to do yourself in a while um so i i really challenge myself to still perform in shows i'm just like dipping mm -hmm. my feet to directing which is That's a new great. thing for me but like another um, type of practice-based work that feeds directly into then what I'm doing as an artist uh, and as a scholar. I'm sure we're going to get into this at some point, Tony, but I'm thinking about like my most recent project, Shakespeare, because mm -hmm. that was like the dream world of, of um, artistic practice and scholarship sort of dovetailing because it was this immersive like <laughs> horror theater experience. Oh so like mm -hmm. spooky things that I love um, and <laughs> And talk about from a well here's what people believed about ghosts in the elizabethan era from a scholarly perspective but at the same time i'm just like getting to be up on my feet um using my hands working with actors which is like there's nothing more fun than that uh yeah. so yeah i i don't know if i actually answered your question or just continued to sort of like be like yes i think the two are connected <laughs> i think you did because i also think about the fact that and i'm sure you feel the same way now that you've been engaging in more of the scholarship there's there's something fundamentally wrong with the idea of writing scholarship that is inaccessible right that's like mm -hmm. only going to be read by the five people that you happen to cite and i uh, think that the more we're merging the creative and the critical the more we're getting people you know we use that phrase of like popular audience i would just like for us to just be writing books for audiences you know and not yeah. feel this need to separate yeah. the two and i think that creators know how to do that really well and that's something that that scholars need to think about uh, if we want us to be relevant right in another 10 years or so i couldn't agree more and i just go back to our entire chosen field is storytelling so we need to be mm -hmm. writing even academic scholarly or whatever you want to call it writing needs to be compelling as a story in the way that we think of quote unquote popular writing being right like i i I don't know, I and I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but I hate reading those ac academic articles that are like, the first paragraph is like the summary of everything to come, and then it's like, and now I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then the final paragraph is like, re sort of capitulating everything that was just said, and it's great for pulling quotes, right? It's great for yes. like, mm -hmm. grad student reading to be like, what's the main point? <laughs> yes. What, you know? Yeah. But, but is it the most interesting um kind of writing is it the kind of writing that really like gets you excited and invested not always right like sometimes i want it to be more narrative i want like a, a good story i want to be engaged even by a piece of scholarly writing that's amazing that, that makes me excited it makes me also want to like cancel my meetings for the rest of today and just like <laughs> enjoy the the fun of learning again but i don't think that will happen <laughs> <laughs> So we'll go ahead and shift into some of our questions. We have one, we try to have a couple questions that we ask like everyone. And, and one of Great. them that we ask is, is about just sort of like, 
what you're reading and watching, mainly because Tony and I both use this as a list of things to like write down and we're like, fantastic. And so the question it's, is- It's great for getting suggestions. It, it really is. <laughs> what is a horror text? It could be a film, it could be a play, it could be a book, anything that you engaged with in this last year that just sort of moved you? Oh, I love this question. Um, and I, I'm also, <laughs> In thinking about this, I'm struggling because I'm like, ooh, then do I also have to define like what I even think horror is? Because I feel like some of the things coming to mind you, are kind of like If crossover. you would like to define horror, you absolutely oh can. This is a horror podcast yeah. for conversations about horror. But you should also know, know that I, I don't say. know. Yeah, I, I often <laughs> say I don't know what the how to define the genre, and it's kind of meaningless at the same time. It's really important. So no judgments. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I'm just going to, I'm going to just throw out a few things coming to my mind here. Maybe together we can decide if they actually qualify as horror or not. Um, uh, I think it was back in August. Yeah, it was right before school started up again. I, so I'm a little late to the party here, but I watched Archive 81 on Netflix. Yes. Uh, and I liked it. I thought like the actors were all super appealing. Um, there were a couple twists I didn't see coming, which is actually hard for me because a lot of times I do see the twists coming. Um, and I just, it may have also been heightened by the fact that I was in the throes of COVID for the first time while I was watching it. And my husband was away for a full month. Um, oh. I was alone in the house, which is the longest I've ever been apart in our yeah. like 12-year relationship, uh, alone in a house uh, from him. So m that may have like heightened the experience. But I was like, oh, like this is actually spooky. Um, I'm, I'm really feeling this right now. And it kind of reminded me of this other show that I really love that is no more um, R.I.P., which is Channel Zero. I don't know yes. if you remember that oh anthology. Um, I loved Channel Zero and was really sad that it didn't continue. And so, and I felt there was just like a little mm -hmm. kernel of that uh, in Archive 80, 81 that I was really feeling. Um, and also, uh, fun sidebar story, but um, Nick Antosca, who wrote Channel Zero, I knew like 20 years ago oh in his early 20s, Whoa. Uh, he submitted to this literary journal called Opium Magazine that I um, was a co-editor for for a while. So like I remember like line editing some of his like really early fiction and like this cool. would have been like, I don't know, like 03 or something. And it was great. Wow. But then like, you know, I, I, I didn't know what became of him. And then I saw Channel Zero and I saw Nick Antosca and I was like, holy cow this is the same Nick and like, look what he's done. This is freaking amazing. I was so happy for him. Like just thought it was so good. Yeah. I was, so. I was really enjoying channel zero. I was late to that because I, I find that most of the horror that I have time to watch is the really, really, really bad horror that I have in the background while I'm sending emails. Right. <laughs> and, and so I have seen, if it is a film about zombies and animals that is like not even B, it's like C, I have seen it. If it's a quality thing, I may not have seen it because I realize as I start to watch it, I'm like, no, I actually want to watch this. And that was how I felt about Channel Zero. Um, and I've started Archive 81, but I haven't finished it because I again ran into that problem. These are great recommendations because yeah. I haven't heard, I hadn't seen either of these. So well, we I have two do more show. for you. Yes. Oh, but I'm I have so to excited. ask you if they count as horror. So these are the two that I'm like, mm. so like yellow jackets. Yeah. Is that horror? I loved it. And I can't wait for the new season. But is that horror? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's tricky because there, there are these texts. And the one that I always think of, because it's the one that students inevitably ask me about, is the film Seven, right? Like mm -hmm. Seven Horror. Or yeah. is it a thriller? And and that's where I'm like, at this point, doesn't matter, right? Like, does it make you feel uncomfortable and scared? Then I think it's horror. Or is the primary objective to like thrill you, right? Like, and to make you be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna hunt down the killer. So I think like for some people, Seven and Yellow Jacket are thrillers because they're more like, here's what I would do in this situation. And I think yeah. for other people, it's like, dear heavens, that is literally my nightmare come true. In which case, I think <laughs> for those people, and I would fall into that camp for yellow for what yes. I have seen in Yellow Jackets. Yes, I'm not yeah. done, but yeah. <laughs> that it was like, it. no, this is like everything I feared as a teenage girl, right? I know. I was like, I don't know if this is a female Lord of the Flies. I don't know if this is lost. I don't know if this is like 
about to go full supernatural, yes. like witchcraft mm. like i don't know what is happening but i am here for it and i i love it i think it's great and um, i think the reason i stopped watching it is actually just because of what you said because I, sometimes i struggle with shows that are like we're not going to tell you what we are and this is our clever move and you just have mm -hmm. to hold on and maybe in season seven we'll make some big reveals and sometimes i really struggle with that because sometimes i want to know that they actually know right <laughs> yeah, rather yeah, yeah. than them being like we'll yeah. see how the audience goes and then we'll tell you which way we're leading <laughs> um and i felt like i didn't make it past the hump of yellow jacket where i just embraced that ambiguity and i think i need to go back mm -hmm. and, and watch it i you're with my husband on that he's like what is this is it blah 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 yeah. or is it and i'm like what does it have to be and he's like no 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 <laughs> <laughs> he really does yeah, not yeah. care for that yeah. either um, okay, my last one that I just started watching, so I'm not the whole way through, and maybe it's sci-fi or speculative fiction, maybe I can't call it horror, but like Kindred is scary as hell. Oh, I haven't <laughs> even started that one yet. Okay. I mean, I, I, Octavia Butler, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. based on her book, yeah. which I've never read, but been told I should read for years, and adapted by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, so like yeah. theater royalty. Um, I, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be considered horror. Maybe it's like speculative fiction, but it is, it's scary as hell. Yeah. <laughs> really scary. Yeah. It's so okay. good. Excellent, excellent. Tony, we These should do a long form. Yeah, we should review a long form again, like we did with Ash vs. Evil Dead. And, I, and pick one of these from Heather's suggestion. These are these are all great recommendations. I I. I guess we'll have to watch them to yeah. see if they are horror. Yeah, not, your next podcast. That's right. You tell <laughs> yeah. me. You tell me if you think they're horror. <laughs> That's so great. So you kind of briefly mentioned in your introduction the, some of the research that you were working on. So mm -hmm. I'd kind of love if you could just like explain to the listeners what is what is the research you're currently working on and what form you're hoping that it will eventually take. Yeah. Um, so the form I'm hoping it will take is a dissertation. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> which is, thanks. Thanks for that softball there. Um, which is I'm hoping to um, turn in, gosh, like a year, year and a half from now, which is terrifying. Yeah. Um, so I'm really just like you're catching me right at the beginning of the thick of it, right? Uh, and originally, I saw this project as sort of a deep dive into the hauntings associated with the Alley Theater in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of what I started with. And then <laughs> just about two months ago, I pivoted and was mm -hmm. like, no, 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 it can't be a deep dive into the Alley. I want to do these three case studies. Very neat. Um, this comparative analysis with the Alley being one of the three. Um, and I'll get into why in just a second, but I, I I just, I had this feeling, I was like, ah, I don't know, I think I'm supposed to, I think that I think the alley is an important part of it, but I think like I need to expand my scope a little bit. And a few of the members of my committee were like, yeah, I think, I think this actually, I think you're talking about looking at this in a few different environments, not just the one. So mm -hmm. we'll see if that was the right decision, but I'm sort of um, just now pivoting from focusing on the one theater and looking at three. Uh, but so in a nutshell, I, I'm sort of looking at ghost stories associated with these three purportedly haunted theaters here in the United States, um, the Alley in Houston, uh, the Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut, uh, and the uh, Le Petit Théâtre de Vieux Carré, mm -hmm. pardon my terrible French accent, which uh -huh. is um, located in the French Quarter in New Orleans. Um, so three geographically really different theaters, um, really different in terms of like community or professional theater and the sort of work like developed and produced there. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at the ghost stories um, associated with these theaters uh, in a couple different capacities. So I'm looking at um, the ghost stories as documented in like media, so like newspaper articles, um, social media in some cases, um, the theaters have been featured on like most haunted kind of lists or um, like paranormal TV shows. Um, so sort of the um, second, third hand um, versions of the ghost stories. Uh, and then interviewing whatever possible current and former staff members of these theaters 
um, about their personal experiences and sort of seeing how they line up. Um, and this was inspired by my initial research into the alley, um, which started, I guess, in 2020. Um, the Association for Theater and Higher Education um, was going to have their 2021 conference in Texas before they decided to go virtual because of the pandemic. So I had been just researching purportedly haunted theaters in Texas, thinking this would be a good pitch for this conference um, that I'm looking at. And of all the theaters I looked at, I stumbled on the alley. And the alley was sort of immediately compelling to me because there is a documented traumatic event there, which mm. was the murder of their managing director, Iris Sith, in 1982, on the premises yeah. of the theater by a former security guard by the name of Clifford Phillips. Wow. So right off the bat, I'm like, oh, it makes total sense that this place is haunted because yeah. someone was actually killed there. It's not an urban legend. It's within our lifetime. It's in like the last 40 years. There might even be people working at the theater still who knew this person personally. Um, so it made a lot of sense to me that there were all these like newspaper articles about the theater being haunted and there are um, ghost tours in Houston um, that take people by the theater and sort of recount um, this brutal murder. Uh, but then this really interesting thing happened where when I started to talk to some former employees of the theater, they're like, oh, no, 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 it's not haunted by Iris Siff, it's someone else. Hmm. And I'm like, what do you mean? And mm -hmm. I started hearing stories about this indigenous woman being spotted in the wings of the theater. Hmm. Um, so right off the bat, I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting because Iris Sip was white. So right. not her. It's not um, her. <laughs> it's not her. It's not the, the newspaper article, articles will say, oh, it's up on, you know, the second floor um, where the conference or office, uh, the conference room or office was that she was murdered. And they're like, no, 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 we're seeing this woman in the wings. Like, it's mm. nowhere near there. Um, and it is documented that there was a, a female boarding house, which is basically a euphemism for a brothel <laughs> in the 19th century at this site in Houston. Um, and that it was uh, a multiracial female boarding house, which was not always super common at the time. So um, some of the theater staff are even like, not only is it an indigenous woman, but we believe she's like this sex worker that lived hmm. in this bordello in the 19th century. They have developed this whole sort of narrative around what the haunting is that is completely at odds with what um, the media and the ghost stores are saying. And I'm sort of like, okay, what is that about? Why is this one story sexier than the other? Mm -hmm. And sort of what I'm landing on is Iris Sith, this white woman, was murdered by Clifford Phillips, who happened to be a black man. Mm. So there are a lot of like really charged racial politics there. Um, and for some reason, that seems to be a narrative that <laughs> we culturally are interested in revisiting over and over again, a, a kind of violence that we're interested in revisiting that, but not, for example, like the erasure of Native Americans right. um, living in Houston. So yeah. who perhaps also met equally violent ends. So um, that got me being like, wow, I, I sort of was attracted by the ghost story to this place, but now I'm like, wow, this is actually about how we continue to exert unequal power in the present <laughs> and like, you know disappear people even after they're already disappeared by death like who yeah. whose stories get to be important and and that then led me to start looking at other sort of gendered and racialized ghosts at these other theaters um and to start seeing this pattern of like okay we're really interested in foregrounding some kinds of ghost stories over others and and what is that about so that, that's a very long answer to your question, but as you can tell, I'm super fascinated by it and could talk about this for hours, you know? That's I just, amazing. I'm really interesting to me. I'd never really thought about the fact that even, even after death, we're still denying certain people voices, right? We're not even allowing them to haunt us because heaven forbid, right, that they be allowed to do that. I, I'd never really thought about that layer of things, and I think that's. I'm. I'm really excited to to learn more. That's that's fascinating. And it reminds so me. Oh, go oh, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead, Tony. <laughs> I was going to ask uh, uh, if you could go into a little bit more detail about the other two hauntings that you have kind of zoned in on. So, and in which ways that those ghost stories kind of also represent a 
choosing of history or if they if they're in a slightly different way than the one at the alley yeah yeah definitely so um i think so in november is when i started being like mm, should i start including yeah. um some other theaters because i happened to go to new orleans and i was presenting at the um american society of research was there uh mm -hmm. last fall and so as I always do, I was like, okay, what are the haunted theater and theaters in New Orleans? I'm going to be there. Like, what can I go see? Were there, how many haunted theaters were there in New Orleans? Is it just this one or were there multiple that you got to go to? So after the fact, I heard from some locals that there are some other um, community spaces where there have yeah. been theatrical performances that might have some stories. But if you were just like Googling it, basically Le Petit is the one that's going to come up. Um, and I think that's also in part because it just has so much history. It's um, by some reports, the longest, like the oldest continuously active theater in the entire United States. Wow. Mm. Um, and it is allegedly the most haunted because depending on which report you look at, there is anything from 11 to 40 different documented entities there. Um, oh, so that's, oh they gosh. have this whole sort of like, the theater doesn't really like lean on this so much, but the ghost tourism industry in the French Quarter absolutely does. Like there's this whole cottage industry of um, including Le Petit on the ghost tours. And even if it's not included, including it on their website is like another haunted place to visit. Like it is, mm -hmm. it's haunting is legendary and also really embedded in like <laughs> cultural tourism in the French Quarter in New Orleans. Um, so looking at the ghosts of Le Petit, so now we enter into another interesting thing I'm realizing I'm going to have to grapple with with my research, which is, um, sort of like cliches and stereotypes about theater people <laughs> and how those manifest themselves in ghost stories because the most famous ghost at Petit is um, supposedly this actress named Caroline. Uh -huh. And um, she's often sort of vaguely dated to the early days of the theater, um, which could be anywhere from like 1920 to like 1940 or something right. some more specifically say like 1920s or 1930s and some you know just to cover their bases are like early days and don't really provide <laughs> anything um, but she so there are many iterations of her story um on websites on ghost tours if you take them on um a few like ghost story anthologies of ghost stories in New Orleans that will include like all kinds of ghost stories and she'll happen to be one of the featured ones. And kind of the different iterations of her story are that she died on premises um, from a fall. It's always from a fall, but there's sort of like mixed versions of was it from a balcony? Was it from an attic window? Was it from a railing on the second floor? Um, most versions of the story are like she fell uh, over a railing or a balcony into the courtyard below. So if you're picturing these typical um, beautiful old residences in the French Quarter where there's that interior courtyard mm -hmm. and kind of like the balconies that go all the way around it, Le Petit is, is such a building. And so a lot of the versions mm -hmm. are, of the story are like, she falls to her death in the courtyard below. Now, whether it was like an accident, she committed suicide, she was like pushed, this is where all of the iterations sort of start to shift. And some of the more salacious ones are like, well, she was having this affair. Mm. She was married, um, but she was having an affair with another actor at the theater and he was also married. And their trysts would be in this like second floor attic or you know storage room or something. And her husband found out they were having this affair. And then this terrible thing happened. And whether like it was an accident or she took her own life or like something more nefarious happened, they relate it to this like alleged affair she was having. So right off the bat, we have like, ooh, all actresses are prostitutes, right? right. <laughs> we have like the age old, like sort of, yeah, um, actors are promiscuous, right? Mm -hmm. In this sort of alleged mm -hmm. affair. Um, which is interesting, but then, so what Caroline is known for as a ghost is being extremely helpful. Hmm. Like she's not considered huh. this like traumatic like or mischievous or anything. No, or even like, oh, she's in the corner crying about this terrible thing that happened to her or, oh, she's returned from the dead for justice to mm -hmm. be like, 
Yeah. I, I didn't take my own life. I was murdered. You know, none of that. She is known for like helping people find lost items. Hmm. So like when items disappear in the theater, and often that's attributed to a different ghost, by the, mm -hmm. by the way, where they'll be like, he moves things or he steals things. <laughs> they mm -hmm. People will literally invoke Caroline and be like, Caroline, where are... I mean, <laughs> one example was like swords that were missing, like prop swords. And yeah. like they ended up being in a place that had already been searched. <laughs> they like call in Caroline and these swords show up. So I'm like, okay, there's like also some interesting <laughs> gender politics here. Yeah. Like, ooh helpful caroline will just like find things for you and like it's yeah. not about her being like the victim of either like a tragic accident or something even worse than that like coming back you know she's back to just like help right. people like help <laughs> theater tech techies find things um so i i find that really interesting um and then one other ghost that I'm sort of really troubled by at that theater that ties into this idea of sort of like the racialized ghost is one ghost that doesn't even have a name that they just refer to as the black or the African-American manservant, mm. um, oh. which already I'm like, yeah. I'm cringing. Um, this ghost, and this ghost I think may have been entirely created by the tourism industry because I don't find this ghost in older versions of the stories about the theater. So mm. that's, that's interesting too. This ghost is only seen on the exterior of the theater. So he quite literally embodies like, black people not being allowed inside Le Petit. The Bar. othering mm -hmm. of that. Yep. Like, yeah. he is literally never seen past the threshold of the theater. Mm. He is supposedly, like, waiting in perpetuity outside the door. And these descriptions of him on these, like, ghost tourism websites will say things like, he is a sad reminder of the poor treatment people used to receive. And I'm mm. like, whoa. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Very yeah. Very much poor, being like poor, used poor treatment to... is doing a lot of heavy yeah. lifting yeah. in this sentence. Like, <laughs> um, and, and yes, and the fact that it's described as it's in the past, it's not happening anymore. I'm also like manservant. Like, yeah. is he enslaved? He probably was, considering the time period you're dating him to. So that's like a weird elision of what's actually going on here. Um, it's an fact interesting that he's, word choice. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> fact that he's anonymous, he doesn't get a name like Caroline yeah. does. Like. He's just the unnamed black manservant. And is there um, something about the descriptions that make them immediately go to manser manservant and that's in quotations? Or because, like, couldn't it just be a gentleman, right? Like, what is making them yeah. think that that's what he has to fall into? Do you know? Um, I don't know, other than these websites will speculate. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but in most cases, they're using words like he's waiting for his master inside. Oh. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. A uh, lot of questions here. Uh, and the fact that he's supposedly only seen on the outside of the theater and maybe was like himself created by the ghost tourism industry, that's interesting to me because the ghost tours aren't allowed to take people inside, right? It's uh -huh. like a private property but they can take you out on the outside so maybe they've created this ghost who supposedly only haunts the exterior so that people might think they're actually going to see something okay. so that's that's oh, yeah. one thing that i'm wondering about but i'm really disturbed by the way that they characterize his waiting mm -hmm. as if it's like patient so literally like this likely enslaved black man in real life spends his life being enslaved and now like in a his afterlife is like still waiting like yeah I have a lot of issues with Absolutely. that story. <laughs> mm. A lot of issues. So, I mean, and those are just two of the many ghosts at Le Petit that are um, troubling, but also fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, for, not not for so much for the ghosts, but what it says about us, um, right? yes. the people we like circulating these stories about them. We have this conversation all the time in when we're talking about like horror films or books and that so much of horror, the horror genre really is just a reflection of what scares us and what scares us is often kind of scary uh, to, yep. if you really sit and th think about it. And I think this is a fantastic example of that. And it's real, it's real life though. It's not, we're not, it's, these are real yeah. stories about, and in some cases, really they're evoking real human beings. And so mm -hmm. the consequences are a lot different in that than when we talk about like in a film or something. Stakes right. are a little totally. bit higher here. And particularly when you're now like making money off of it, when you introduce the whole like 
tourism component yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then, so the last theater, I got totally sucked into Le Petit, but <laughs> the last theater um, is actually the one that I have done the least preliminary research on, but is the one that I know most intimately mm. because I studied there as an undergrad. Oh, that's neat. Um, so the O'Neill Theater Center in Connecticut is um, also the home to uh, National Theater Institute, to NTI, which is this program that um, undergraduate theater students can do for one semester, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And you're in residence at the O'Neill um, in Connecticut. And so this is the place where before I even got, I guess I was like 21, it was 2001 when I studied there. Before I even got there, I had been warned by like other theater folk I knew that had done the program of like, that place is haunted as hell. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, before I even got there. So I was like primed before I even got there to be like, oh my God, something's going to happen. So, you know, yeah. it's just like, and I kind of <laughs> wanted something to happen. And I was also like terrified that something was going to happen. Um, and this sort of like alleged haunting there, um, which my next steps will now be to go to Connecticut and actually dig into the archives and be like, is there any proof any that such a person that. ever existed? Um, so the ghost there goes by the name of Lucy. Um, she also has a super gendered and cliched story about like hanging herself in like a closet in the attic is the most sort of like popular um, version of her story, which seems totally like a cliched sort of urban legend, like the servant that hung herself in the right. attic. Okay. Some versions of the story are like she was pregnant or like rejected by her lover and that's why she took her life. So, okay. Again, there's like great, some sort of like <laughs> possible like, Sexism or misogyny woman. going on here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the really interesting thing about Lucy, um, whether you believe in her or not, is at least 20 years ago when I was there, the staff absolutely believed in her to the extent yeah. that so she's said to haunt what um, on the, the grounds of the O'Neill is known as the mansion, um, like the big sort of fancy house where like the library and the cafeteria and stuff is. And it's up in the attic, which is what has been converted into the library that she's sort of known to lurk around. But um, since you're in residence at the O'Neill and you live in one of the, they don't have dorms, but they have like a farmhouse mm. and a cottage that students live in. So when I was there on the second floor, there were rooms in the mansion that would be used by NTI students, but they would never put any male identifying students in there. Mm. And they literally said it was because in the past, Lucy would shake their beds and they found that if they put female identifying students in there, it didn't happen. Hmm. So this is like, even if you think ghosts are total bunk yeah. and you don't believe in any of this, this belief is real enough that it is like impacting decisions of like undergraduate students housing yeah, <laughs> or at wow. least it did 20 years ago, um, wow. which I just found fascinating. Everyone there just took it as like a complete given that she was real and whenever anything weird would happen they'd be like yeah lucy like the groundskeepers would just be like oh yeah that's lucy and it was just so matter of fact and second nature i mean and honestly this is probably where my like sort of like fascination with yeah. theater ghost was born because i was just like everybody's just treating this like it's totally normal but then again like we work in this field that has a ghost light and doesn't think that's weird like <laughs> that's so true i there, mean there's i think that kind of leads us in do you that yeah. leads us into our next question? It, it does. Do you want to? Yeah, because you know, like, there are certain places that when people say these places are haunted, you're like, yes, the sanatorium, right, is haunted. <laughs> I I got my PhD at the University of Louisville, and that's and you know Kentucky's where okay, Waverly yeah. Sanatorium is, and it's like if there was a place that was to be haunted, it makes sense that it would be a, a sanatorium for people with TB, right? But I yeah. think it's really interesting that that you're looking at this angle with the theater. So can you talk a little bit about what you see as the relationship between theater and maybe horror more generally, but but also theater and ghosts, right? Because that's that's where you're narrowing your focus. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, so relationship between horror and theater, I think is like a complicated one. Um, I read once so this is not my idea, it's someone else's idea that of course I can't remember now <laughs> who's been there, whose idea it was, but I, I was like, I totally agree with this. So I, I read um, an article by a practitioner once that said, hey, there are two things that are nearly impossible to really execute well on stage, <laughs> and they are something genuinely sexy, 
mm-hmm. and something genuinely scary. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is so true. This is so true. When I like think about things I've watched, I can think of tons of like horror movies or books that like scare the living daylights out of me. But I'm like, you know what? There actually aren't that many instances of theater no. where I was truly scared like truly scared things that were like cool or suspenseful or spooky but like actually legit scared no i really can't think of that so i only recently had an experience here in denver with a horror element within within a show that is not self-horrifying but there was a jump scare executed at the local production here it's been going on for 27 years of a Christmas Carol with mm. the ghost of Jacob Marley, in which there is a real, there's a in the there's a trap door that they do to kind of unexpectedly shoot this guy up and do a real life in person jump scare. I've never seen executed on stage yeah. before, but that's the first time I've ever seen that because it's not of common convention within the field, like you're alluding to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean. I guess the, the scariest thing I can think of also was not in a piece of horror theater at all. Um, and it was more a piece of theater magic that I could not figure out how it was done. And so it was, mm-hmm. I, I audibly gasped. And that was a few years ago in London. I saw this production by, um, I think it was Frantic Assembly, who are this mm-hmm. wonderful theater company. And uh, it was called, the production was called Stockholm. And there's this, it's like dance theater movement theater so it's very active throughout just two characters and there's this moment of this um they're sort of locked in this like battle that is like sort of like sexy and seductive and sort of really violent that is sort of like encapsulating um the trajectory of their relationship and there's this moment with this desk and i think it was the the female character um where like she brings her head down full force onto the desk and so you are like scared for the actor because it, it's not you yeah. know there's no like nap stage combat stuff like she brings her and and so i remember like gasping like oh my god and then her head goes through the table mm-hmm. and i don't know if it was like water that looked like it was solid like i'm still not 100 percent sure how they did it but like she like thwacks her head on the desk and it actually goes through mm-hmm. and everyone mm-hmm. in the audience was just like oh my god like that that is the scariest thing i've ever seen and that that's not even like horror theater yeah a little bit yeah but yeah the shows i've uh, seen so louisville has a great dracula show that they put on every year um yes. and in saint george utah there's a gorgeous red rock amphitheater and they always do like a halloween mm-hmm. show but again right there might be moments where you're like that was pretty cool or like yes i can see the person under the bed that you know the main character can't see yeah. but it, yeah. i don't remember ever being scared once in either of those and tony will tell you i'm i'm a huge fan in a way that tony is not of jump scares so like i'm there and ready to be scared at any <laughs> given moment but it, i think you're right there's something about that like communal aspects even though in theaters movie theaters we can be scared right but there's something about like mm-hmm. being there with other people and that suspension of disbelief that's just doesn't transfer as readily into horror yeah yeah and i when i think of things that are um exceptions or more successful so i'm starting to think now of like things like haunted attractions Mm -hmm. Um, or ghost walks really more haunted attractions where i have been legitimately scared at least for for moments and like i would argue i'd argue that is a form of theater or at least a form of performance if people are going to quibble over the word theater like so i mean i guess there is theater that can be scary but maybe it does need to have sort of that immersive element to like push it over the comfort level or something i'm not totally sure what that is but yeah thinking about the second half of your question which is yeah. sort of like ghosts in theater specifically ghosts in theater um i i don't know so when i first sort of like had this dream of writing a book about ghosts in theater it really just started with me collecting um ghost stories that theater people had told me about places they they mm-hmm. worked really mm-hmm. um and i just thought that was interesting right like theater people in general seem to have a wealth of ghost stories, at least within my life, which is interesting. Yeah. So the first thing I'm noting is like, why are all these people theater people that mm-hmm. have great ghosts? And the second <laughs> thing is like, why are so many of the stories connected to theaters themselves? Um, which got me thinking about 
is there something about the artistic practice of theater or the venue of theater as an artistic practice that sort of like engenders a belief in, in ghosts or like a willingness or more openness to that? I mean, that makes sense to me. Like we are a storytelling form. So yeah, it kind of makes sense to me that that's how, that's how we make yeah. sense of the world already. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, wouldn't we also do that through ghost stories? And then, I mean, obviously performance studies has sort of like a whole branch that is talking about theater as disappearance mm -hmm. um, and theater being this ephemeral thing and describing theater in terms that are really similar to a ghost sighting, yes. right? It's this thing yeah. that's there. Maybe uh, nobody witnesses it exactly the same way. It's never going to be the same experience again. Yeah. And then it vanishes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously been pushback in the field on sure. categorizing theater that way too. But I, I don't know. There's it, A ghost needs an audience, right? Like. It's kind of like the if a tree falls in the woods, does anyone hear it, right? Like a ghost wouldn't be a ghost unless someone felt it or saw it in some way. Yeah. I think. I, like I think a ghost by definition requires a witness, which is like theater sort of by definition needs an audience. So to me, mm. it kind of makes sense that this would be if if the theater's already this repository of like stories and memory and um has this like death like quality of bringing things to life and then disappearing them again like it, it actually makes total sense there would be so many ghost stories yeah. associated with them and often theaters are the oldest building in a community which if, if we're thinking about things like asylums or hospital like you know older creepy buildings like in some cases that is the theater right it's yeah. like the most historic building yeah. um in a community i i think that's lovely and i also want to acknowledge I, I think you're absolutely correct about the haunted experiences, you know, like Halloween haunts and stuff being, if not, if people don't want to use the word theater, then they have to use a performance art. I'm a huge, that's like one of my favorite things yeah. to do. We don't have as many in Me San too. Antonio, but Kentucky, I had enough that I was going in, in the Halloween season to two or three weekends, right? For every weekend. And it was, it was my favorite. And my favorite of those are actually the actor based ones that are in supposedly haunted places. Like I did one at Waverly. I did one at the St. Mary, you know, the ship. And like, those are scarier because even though I'm not entirely sure I believe in ghosts, I believe the atmosphere is, it's hard to deny, right? As opposed to, you know, someone's building that you're like, this is your backyard, isn't it? And they're like, yes, it is, you know, whereas 100%. you're like, yeah. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, and I'd love to see that be your second book. So, you know, when you're done with your first book, if you need when someone to, to yeah. write one. but if you need someone to go with you on all of these as quote work, I will join you in a heartbeat. <laughs> yes, yes, please, yes, please. So you kind of also mentioned in there that one of the things that you liked about um, some of the horror experiences, the haunted houses, is that immersive element. Mm -hmm. uh, so you recently worked on an immersive good segue. Yeah, that was a good segue. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare. Thank, Shakespeare. Thank uh, so this it imagines what would happen if Shakespeare characters came to life and were haunting CU Boulder's campus. Yes. So could yes. you talk a little bit more about creating this particular horror theatrical experience? I can. <laughs> I can and I will. Tell Yay. You. <laughs> so, uh, so Shakespeare, um, I want to give credit where credit is due, is the brainchild of uh, Andy Park and Kevin Rich originally. Uh, Andy mm -hmm. Park is currently the artistic director of Nebraska Rep. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kevin Rich is the associate chair of our Department of Theater and Dance at CU. And um, they've described it to me as it sort of started as this kernel of a, an idea um, back in 2014, um, when Kevin was teaching in Illinois and working with Illinois Shakes and was, I think it started as like, they were trying to find a way to like get college students involved with the festival, if I remember the story correctly. Um, and so they kind of were like, well, what if we had like a haunted house or a haunted trail, like an outdoor haunted house, um, mm -hmm. that had Shakespeare characters. And what That's if it was cool. like, the Shakespeare characters are just like running amok and have like trapped Shakespeare himself in a cage. And um, there wasn't really much of a like narrative beyond like <laughs> that. Like you want to be in a haunted house with Shakespeare characters. But, um, but that's it was, a great it was, idea, right? It is. Yeah, yeah, like, that's mean, a fantastic idea. <laughs> totally. Um, and Shakespeare is rife with characters that are perfect for this sort of treatment because yes. it's all like 
bloody death and like people going mad and characters who are haunted by literal ghosts yep exactly exactly there's a lot of like um great source material right there so uh so that was in 2014 when they had sort of the first iteration of shakespeare um they've done another version of it for the past i think two years um at nebraska rep um where they've really leaned hard so andy is like a fantastic puppeteer uh -huh. uh, and has a lot of um experience with animatronics as mm. well so i think like the second incarnation at nebraska rep really leads hard and like amazing um like tech stuff That's like cool. really really super cool um haunted house technology as well and so our version at cu it was really important to us that it be um actually building off of what you were just talking about katie like theater and actor based mm -hmm. because we were putting it into the department of theater season so mm -hmm. this needed yeah. to be like an actual legit training experience for our students um not just in immersive theater but um for many students who'd never done any form of shakespeare before like what what is that like uh so we were trying to give it a little bit more of a narrative um, for those reasons and to make sure that there was enough actual text that the students had something to really like sink their teeth into, yeah. um, pun intended. <laughs> and yeah. so it was it was a great experience. Um, the three of us co-directed it, Andy, Kevin, and myself. Um, Kevin happened to know that I my research was around ghost stories uh, and haunted theaters and was like, is this something up your alley? And I was like, 100%. <laughs> um, so we sort of divided up um, the scenes or the worlds in the immersive event. Um, and I took the lead on like three of them. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Tony here was my amazing AD on the show. I didn't know that. Uh, That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Tony, Tony was with us at the beginning of the pro process and mm -hmm. Tony, Tony did this fantastic job of, um, the musical direction because mm -hmm. a lot of our characters had sung um oh. lines as well as spoken lines so we had like you know sort of that creepy ophelia ethereal voice yes. coming through the graveyard that kind of stuff uh and tony also helped me to think about and implement some um de-rolling and safety exercises okay. practices in rehearsal because so on one hand it's like ooh, shakespeare it's ah like violent and mm -hmm. creepy anyway we're going to take all the violence and creepy and like cram it into this one hour experience but thinking about like the actors wow that's sort of like a rough thing to inhabit yeah <laughs> and they like also have month. to be able to repeat this yes. like over, over and, over, and again. over again and so yeah. it's definitely if it's a lot to try to like put that in your body like yes. as a performer all that yeah. horror it's great to witness <laughs> yes and like definitely something as you katie talked about it's great for audiences when it hits but right. you don't want to also put the actors in that constant state the whole time yeah 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 so so tony honestly you were instrumental in helping me Yay. think about and implement some some great um de-rolling exercises in rehearsal um and i still like if i were to do this again there are still things that i i think needed um like logistical things like so we did it the month of uh two weeks in the beginning of the month of october okay. and even though like our costume designs took in the fact that the students were going to be outside and cold it was cold yes. like, right? it was still cold yep. um so like you know halfway through the run being like can can the stage managers bring them hot tea is there enough time before like the next group yes. of people is running around um realizing after the fact some of these students they're freshmen they don't necessarily have the adequate vocal training yet yeah. and like they're being asked to do mm -hmm. these really intense so that I think we still could have done even better than we did on some of those practices and that's what I would want to put even more attention on mm -hmm. if we ever out the show but in terms of storytelling and spectacle i i'm so proud of the students i think they did an incredible job um, and it, it was so much fun to work on it was like the perfect blend of things i love anyway and like getting to play with actors so i mean it was it was a dream that's thing to exciting. work on that's so exciting yeah one of the things that you kind of talked about a little bit but i I, I would love to just kind of know more. You said that when you were at the O'Neill Theater, right, that that might have been the, when the seeds were planted, right, that has led That's to correct. everything, including Shakespeare, um, which makes me giggle every time I hear the pun. Uh, <laughs> do you, like, while you were there, were there, you talked about how the staff, you know, really, like, relied on on that character, that ghost. 
did you feel like there was something that you could be like, I'm either I've experienced something or I've experienced something ten, you know, like so and so my best friend experienced something like, did you have an encounter or did you get to be closer to the action than just hearing from the staff? Yeah. Um, so I was like hoping slash dreading you asking this question. Yeah. Now, I have to, <laughs> now I have to out myself as like, do I believe in yeah. this basically? Um, and I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm on the fence where I, I definitely don't discount them. I don't know if I'm prepared a hundred percent to be like, yes, yeah. but I yeah. will say the, the like three things that I have happened to me in my life, I can't explain happened at the O'Neill. So hmm. I'm like, maybe, maybe. And now of course you're going to want to know what the three things yeah. are. So. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that was I a leading sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll tell them in. I'll, 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 I'll tell the most boring one first and I think the most <laughs> compelling one last. So the first thing is just like a dumb thing, I think, but like, I can't explain it. So I'll include it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the residences that the students lived in, so the one I lived in is known as the farmhouse. And I think it literally is an old farmhouse. It certainly looks mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so two of the three things happened in the farmhouse. So the farmhouse, I don't think is haunted by Lucy. So I don't know who it was or whatever, but um, the first one is like silly. So in the, the shared bathroom on the second floor, um, there was uh, like a night light or, or like a light plugs in in case people got up in the middle of the night. And so they wouldn't fall down the stairs as they were trying to get to the bathroom and by the sink. And there was one night in the middle of the night, I think I got up to pee or something. Um, and I was washing my hands and the light flickered. Mm. And I didn't really think anything of it because I was like, oh, power or like old bulb or, you know, mm -hmm. any any number of normal rational reasons. Um, but it seemed to be doing it every time I moved my hand in a certain way. Mm. So then I was like, oh, in, in my sort of like half asleep state, I was like, oh, I never noticed this was a motion sensitive light before. Um, cause that was like, that was like the only explanation because it, it was now only going on and off when I did certain things. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, weird. And I went to bed and I thought nothing else about it. That was not a motion sensitive light and mm. it never did that again. <laughs> and again, I'm like, man, eh, but faulty wiring, like yeah. <laughs> there could be a million explanations, but I did think it was weird that it only did it the one time and only did it like every time I moved my hand. Mm -hmm as if it was like in response to me. But I was like, okay, weird, but like, just weird. It, shoot, yeah. Number two, and number two and number three had another person there. So I feel like that gives mm. it a little more credence of something strange happening. Again, I don't know if I'm prepared to say ghosts, but so also in the farmhouse, I, um, this is funny actually, I had been given my own room. It was adjoining to this other girl, Molly's room. Um, but like, because I had heard that the O'Neill was haunted <laughs> and then I had told Molly that we ended up just sharing her room oh, because funny. we were like nervous something was going to happen. And, um, but nothing had happened. Nothing had happened. It was like well into the semester. And, um, one day our alarm go clock goes off as it always does in the morning to wake us up. Um, so we wake up, we're sort of like in a half sleep state, moving about, um, getting up to pee, getting dressed, getting ready to go get breakfast. And I think we had like yoga in the morning or something. Um, and at one point, one of us like noticed how dark it still was outside the window and like kind of clocked that and was like, oh, it's not usually this. I know we wake up early, but it's not usually this dark out. And we look at the clock and it's like in the middle of the night. Like, it's, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I don't remember if it was like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., but it was like way before our alarm would have been set to go off, which would have been like six or hmm. seven or something. And so we were like, oh, that's kind of weird. Um, but again, it was like a weird thing, not a creepy, right. ooh, spooky thing. <laughs> yeah. So we like reset the alarm, but it was just strange because the alarm was always set to the same time every day. So we didn't really understand how it could have gone off then. Right. Um, and it was not, it was battery operated. So it wasn't plugged into the wall because we were like, was it like a power surge or something? But it, it was, so we're like, maybe yeah. the battery's going, I don't know. So we set it, we double check that it's the right time. We set it again. We turn the lights off. We go back to bed. Like... 10 minutes later, it goes off again. Hmm. And we both kind of like both up and they're like, okay, weird. Not scary, but like weird. Mm -hmm. So we set it again. 
And this time, I think I would say it was like less time, maybe more like just a couple minutes or at most maybe like five minutes past. The alarm goes off and then we hear the alarm go off in the room next to us. Mm. Mm. Again, like way before anyone's alarm would be set. So again, like not like scary, not menacing, but like something was messing with us. Like it just felt like something was messing with us. And so that was number two. So number three, this was the one where I actually was a little scared. So me and another student, Whitney, we're up in, this time we actually were in the mansion, the place allegedly haunted by Lucy, and we were up in the library, which is at the very top in, in what I think was the attic, but has been converted into this nice library. And what I'll say about the library, and I love libraries, mm-hmm. like I, I'm obsessed with libraries. There's This one has a, a feel I never liked. <laughs> like even before this thing happened, I just... I don't know. Have you ever like walked in a space and you just never doesn't have a good feeling to it? Mm-hmm. Don't like it. It's got and bad you vibes. Yeah. yeah. So I never went in the library by myself. I don't know why. I just didn't like it there. I just it mm. felt like I wasn't welcome. I didn't like it in there. But we had to be there that day because we were working on this project. I think for like set design or something. So Whitney and I were up there. There's or at least used to be this big wide table in the middle that we were on either side of. Um, And it was the middle of the afternoon. It was sunny out. It's not like it was two in the morning or something. And we'd been working in silence for quite some time. Everything was normal. And we, I hear this, like, I can only describe it as like an intake of breath. It sounded like, Hmm. like, that's what it sounded like. And I kind of like instantly like got that gross feeling (laughs) on my skin, on the back of my neck. And I ignored it. Because I was like, oh, this is just because I don't like it up here and I'm like psyching mm-hmm. myself out or whatever. And then I hear it again. And it was like something out of a movie. I like, I, so I'm bent over doing, you know, my writing or whatever. I hear it the second time and I lift my head and my eyes and Whitney, she lifts her head at exactly the same time and our eyes meet across the table, unspoken. And I know she heard it too. Mm. And I know that she's unnerved because we literally like look at each other at the same time. And I think we maybe tried to like sit there and keep working and heard it again. And then we're like determined to debunk it because we were actually now actually getting a little scared. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah. we're like, no, 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 no. Like we're gonna, so we start like moving around the room trying to figure out where it's coming from. And we're like, oh, it's gotta be like the wind and the rafters. There's like no wind that day, but okay. We're like, <laughs> it's the wind and the rafters. We're like, maybe it's from the old radiator. This is like an old house. So we like go over to the radiator. The radiator is obviously not on. Like it's none of these things. But like as we move towards the corner where the radiator was, like we can hear it a little like more. And now it feels like it's like like tempting us or like pl- like I don't know. It's now it feels like it's it's answering us and and we both were like screw it. And we just left like so and to this it. day, to this day I'm like I, everyone will tell me it was the wind or the rafter or radiator and like I just don't think it was and yeah. I don't know if I'm prepared to say it was a ghost but it was something and I didn't like it and Whitney also didn't like it and we just had a bad feeling. We left yeah. so. Mm-hmm. And I think what Those I are my three scores. what I love about the work that you're doing is that it really doesn't matter, right? Whether or not you believe in ghosts or or whether you just think that, you know, it's these other things because you are really interested in like what does it say about us, right? That we continue yeah. to build these narratives and stories and and mm-hmm. the part of me that was raised very conservatively Christian, you know, like feels like there are things I'm just not prepared to mess with. Uh, Tony was with me when I watched The Exorcist for the first time because I was like, I will not watch it in my house because I just don't feel like inviting things in there. And then, of course, as I think is true for many people that watch The Exorcist after having experienced the hype, I was like, oh, I'm a little bored now. But but also, I'm really glad that Tony's here. Uh, So, like, you know, there's there's part of me that that doesn't know where I fall either. But I love this idea that that your book is is, and and dissertation and your project is just as much about why we keep building these stories and why we keep mm-hmm. putting these stories on certain identities and bodies and narratives. Um, and often the ones that write maybe shouldn't have their voice <laughs> taken from them and then sort of shoved back in. Uh, so I think I think that you should feel okay 
knowing that you don't know <laughs> where you're ready to identify, <laughs> but also the person that in me that just loves to be scared was delighted by your stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, I'm still grappling with some discomfort around my own attraction yeah. to all of this. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, what does that say about me? Like, why why am I fascinated by it? Why am I attracted to these kinds of stories? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I have some, like, <laughs> discomfort around that about myself. Um, but I think that's, like, healthy and worth looking into. Like, yeah, as you said, it, what, what does this say about the people telling the stories? What does it say about the people interested in hearing and listening to the stories, consuming the stories in whatever way that is? Um, what are the stories that aren't being told and why? It's really exciting. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the end of the interview here. I kind of on the way out, we give all of our guests an opportunity to talk about what their next things are. And if you have any uh, social medias or future projects that you would like to plug, it's also okay if not, but we all like to give everybody the opportunity here <laughs> yes. at the end to talk even more about themselves and their upcoming work. <laughs> and if you want to sort of use as your segue, one of the questions we, we also like to ask is the like, if you had sky's the limit, right? Like, what would you be adapting next? Uh, and so it could even be Ooh. like, a this is where I want to go yes. eventually, but also here's where I'm at right now. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, Great. Can I tackle those in backwards order? You can do it however um, you want. Sky's the limit. Okay. Yeah. So uh, adaptations or like horror, I'd like to see turned into a stage play or something. Yeah. Um, okay. Stay with me here. <laughs> Suspiria? Mm. Like the original 1977 yeah. Dario Argento Suspiria? I think could be a play. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think it could. And I am a sucker for some like dance horror back from my like ballet days. So like Suspiria, I, Black Swan. I hear, like... they're, I, I hear they are making a Black Swan musical. It is in really? development right I now. I heard that too. So, yeah. yeah. So I feel like your calls for Suspiria, the musical or play, are not far off. I feel like that's totally yeah. warranted. I just, there's something, yeah. There's something there's something scary about the discipline of ballet that I think would be like You are literally breaking your body for the yes. art, but yes. and you can only do it for like until you're like in your mid twenties, but it's so beautiful. It's yeah. so beautiful. There's something so alluring about it. And I, it's it's I, what I just said about horror, right? I have this like yeah. conflicted relationship where I love it and I also find it deeply troubling yes. at the same time. Yes. And Absolutely. I I wonder if, if something like Suspiria would would be able to capture what that moment was for you and for Tony in non-horror theater where what disturbed you was knowing that it was somehow real, right? That they had found ah, a way mm -hmm. to, in front of us, without trickery of film, right, make this unexpected thing happen. I could see Suspiria yeah. really leaning in on the like, no, this is actually how bodies operate <laughs> when they're in ballet. You should be terrified. <laughs> so I could see that yeah. also yeah. really being an intriguing thing that could only happen live, right? Ooh, uh, I like that. Yeah. So Suspiria, and then um, this is like a weird pet project I hope to do someday, but um, like a weird hobby, uh, other hobby of mine is genealogy. Mm. And so um, I've done a lot of research into my dad's side of the family, which is Irish Catholic, um, that after leaving Ireland were concentrated in Vermont for like decades upon decades. And so there, I don't think there, she's actually related to me but maybe by marriage like many people removed i found this like crazy murder case oh from 1913 mm. 1913 vermont <laughs> where um okay. this like irish catholic woman and i think she was like in her 40s at the time um mary kerrigan kerrigan was her name mary kerrigan mccarthy like murdered her 53 year old sister hmm. and like buried her in the basement hmm. they eventually find the body she is like charged and goes to trial but um pleads insanity or or actually i don't even know if she pled insanity or they just were like you're a woman you couldn't have meant to kill your sister she ends up at uh waterbury which was like i think at the time still called an insane asylum mm. but like a mental mm -hmm. a mental health facility um she petitions after i don't, I don't remember it's like six or seven years and is released but continues to work 
<laughs> at Waterbury as a warden hmm. until she dies. Interesting. It is like the weirdest story ever. And I'm like, That's I bizarre. think this also could be a piece of dance theater. Some like crazy thing with the two people playing the sisters. I don't know. It's yeah. super out there, but like someday. There's there's someday. something about the domestic element of it that reminds me of the the short play Trifles. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that, but you know, I I got to be in that was my very first undergraduate show that I was a part of. Oh, uh, oh, and amazing. yeah, and and you know, it was just <laughs> Like, again, very small, small theater department. We actually performed in a chapel. Uh, but, like, as a result of being in that show, I have a special place for it in my heart. But it's just that, that like, quietness, right? Like, this is a story mm -hmm. that is strangely quiet, even though it's yes. also wild. Uh, and I just, I think that those are perfect for the stage. So let me know when that's out. And we'll, yeah. Tony and I will be <laughs> in audience. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Let's see. What was the other thing? Things I want to plug? Yes. I guess. Yeah. For future future projects. Um, I think the thing I'm most jazzed about, in addition to really de delving into the writing of the dissertation, is um, CU has opted to give the three of us PhD candidates the opportunity to teach an open topics class in mm. our research. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I requested my semester be this fall, so it would overlap with Halloween, as it obviously, should, yes, with, with spooky season. Um, and I'm going to get to teach a class um, for undergrads about theater and ghosts. That's fun. and I plan to not only like include my own personal research, but like there's going to be a unit on spiritualism and mediumship. There's going to be a unit on like conjure. There's going to be a unit on haunted attractions. Mm, like gosh. I am over the moon like this is I the class i, I would undergrad. have wanted to take i know i, I know. want to take it so badly <laughs> so i mean i don't know that's probably more something i should be pitching to see you undergraduates but like i am that is what i'm super excited about send them the link together. to this podcast that's right yeah yeah <laughs> so that that is the thing i am most like jazzed about in my immediate future that's awesome and do you have any social media that you want people to be following you on if not that's okay you no know, I have a Facebook I haven't visited in a year, so That's fair. people could visit it, but it probably wouldn't tell them anything um, too exciting. I, I am hoping to finally have a website of my creative work in um, scholarship up in the next few months. That's so great. when that ex when that exists, I will pass that along. Perfect. So. Excellent. Wonderful. Tony, good job on <laughs> being like, we will have this interview. Uh, Heather, this has been amazing. It's, it's all the yeah. things that make me excited about horror, about scholarship, about creativity, just like in one nice package. So this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me there. This is like a delight. <laughs> this is like the best way to spend the last yeah. hour and a half. So. Yes. Yes. And on Friday the 13th, right? We have to throw that out there. We have to. It's we have to. the best day of the year. <laughs> That's not Halloween. <laughs> To those of you yeah. listening, you know where to find our social media, which is in the description below. If you uh, want to get in contact with us, if you have questions that you want us to ask Heather, whatever it might be, feel free to get a hold of us. And as always, thank you for listening to our nightmares. And have a spooktacular day. <laughs>
If you are a theater patron and or practitioner that has experienced unexplained and or paranormal phenomena in a theater or theater related structure, Heather invites you to contribute to her research anonymously if you desire by submitting your story to the link provided in this episode's description.